hello everyone. So welcome to this new edition of our Brightex um, online event. So today we have the great pleasure to receive Christine Green. Hello, Christine. <laughs> Um, so Christine is the president of the IFPOC um, committee, so IFPOC, uh, the International Function Points Users Group, and the topic of today will be estimating test and rework um, effort of software projects. So to tell you a bit about us, uh, for those who don't know us, we are the um, official global exam provider for IFPOC. And um, through us, you can have access to the certification exams in a variety of languages, online, of course, and everywhere in the world. So I'll be happy to give you more explanation about that at the end of this webinar. For now, I'll let Christine go on with her wonderful presentation. Um, just a few notes about how it's going to happen. So as you could see, there's a chat option where you can just ask us all of your questions as it goes, and we can respond everything at the very end. And also I will just ask you to please maintain your microphones and videos um, disabled during the talk so um, everything goes smoothly. All right, so thank you, and I will let you, Christine, continue. Thank you, Emilia. Thank you. So, so I'm both the host and the presenter right now, so I'm trying to also make sure that nobody is waiting in the waiting room, and I can see people are still showing up. So let me see if I can multitask. I am, after all, a lady, so uh, let me see if I can manage that. So today I'm going to talk about estimating test and rework effort in software projects. Um, so I'm not a test manager, so there might be some of you guys who got all kinds of test management uh, uh, certifications and stuff like that. I know Brightest is, is quite good at that. Um, but I hope that you will bear with me with, when I share with you the estimating techniques that I use when I, as an estimator, have to estimate test and rework effort. So first, a little bit about myself. As uh, Emilia said, I am the president of IFPOC. IFPOC is a nonprofit organization uh, that is uh, primarily dealing with function point analysis. And if some of you have never heard about function point analysis, I will give you a very short introduction to how I use that from a test and rework effort perspective. Um, I've been working for more than 20 years in some of these large US-based companies, EDS and HP. Um, and I am today an independent consultant. Um, I'm doing kind of like a mixture of being a project manager, so being out on the field with real projects, real software development, and then being this specialist in, uh, in forecasting and estimating of projects. Um, so that was a little bit about myself. Uh, during this session, and I'm just gonna see if I can take a snip of this. I should have done that just a second before. Uh, otherwise, perhaps, Kama, you could uh, do me the favor of taking a snip of this link and put it into uh, the chat. Um, if you get bored about the presentation, there's something you can do there that, uh, that you might find interesting. And now I just need to let somebody in from the waiting room. Um, but uh, there's a couple of questions for you in the AHA slides um, that I would like as a kind of like a feedback, but also your opinion on some of the things and topics we're gonna talk about today. So let's dig in. So first of all, I'm, I'm gonna kind of like do a, a light start. Uh, in 2002, uh, Futrell, Schaefer, and Schaefer created the book Quality Software Project Management. And one of the statements that they had 
in that book was that the single most important task of a project is setting realistic expectations. And that unrealistic expectation based on inaccurate estimates are the single largest cause of software failure. I actually think that even though this uh, statement is now nearly 20 years old, it's still actually true in what we're dealing with. And, and some of the experience that I have as a project manager on these complex projects is that when we reach the testing period, that's when things can really, really fail. And even though there might be a smooth sailing until test period, especially the user acceptance test, then uh, a project can basically fall to pieces and becomes a really, really critical project that is challenged and not successful and sometimes even fails, so never gets delivered. If we uh, look at some of the, uh, the data that we have, this is uh, from the uh, Standage Group uh, chaos report data from 2020. Uh, you can also see that uh, if we look at successful projects, we're actually getting less successful projects in the period 2015 to 2020. Um, we're quite stable on the failed projects. That means projects that never, ever deliver anything. And we have a 35% challenge project. And that means challenge in, in this sense means that they was not on time, they were not in schedule, and they did not bring value uh, as expected to uh, the end users or to the client that has purchased and thought that this software project would change their business model. So even though we have changed a lot of things in how we work, we still have a couple of things that we need to sort out in order to change this. and. I got another presentation I did in December where I talked about the trillions of US dollars that we're actually losing on things like failed projects and, and challenge projects. So if we can kind of like just bump up the, uh, the successful project to be in the range of 95%, uh, even though it might cost us a bit of work in the process to do so, I will ensure you that worldwide we will get a great return of investment on this one. So I think I let everybody in now. So I'm sorry if I'm kind of like, but I'm looking at two screens. Uh, PMI is creating these uh, pulse report and they're talking about what it takes to, to have a successful project. And one of the things is uh, aligning organizational strategy to the project, uh, engaging executive sponsors and control over scope creep. And I don't know how many of you guys uh, that has, uh, is working as either a test manager or a project manager, but sometimes communicating and engaging executive uh, sponsors can be quite difficult. Um, but actually, in my mind, they should be part of the test because it's their business criteria that determines whether a project is successful. So when we look at acceptance of a delivery or acceptance of a software development, you know, accept, acceptance of a software product, uh, we need to make sure that we also engage the executive sponsor. And then there is the never-ending story of uh, scope. Whether it's scope creep, scope changes, it doesn't matter. We need to control the scope and we need to control the scope during the entire process of delivering a software product. And it really doesn't matter whether we are scaled or agile or traditional and hierarchical project managers, we still need to control the scope. Um, and as you can see in the, uh, in the Standish report result, even though we have you know, implemented a lot of uh, good techniques, um, we still haven't reached kind of like the magic 95% of successful projects. And I do believe that one of the reasons is that we still don't have the grasp of how to control scope 
correctly. And trace go from the original intention of the user, the business process definition to the successful delivery and digitalization of the way that we work. I keep on thinking I got everybody in from the waiting room, so I hope I'm going to do that. So again, a, a little bit of, uh, of insight from PMI polls of the profession, this time from 2018. Um, they are measuring these project performance metric and, and they kind of like talk about uh, how many of the project meet the original goals and business intents, how many of the project complete within our original budget, how many complete on time, and how many experience scope creep and failed project budget lost and deemed failures. And this is where I'm going to talk to you about testing, because I actually think that the traceability from the original intent, the original requirements up to the testing phase is some of the things that we need to kind of like control a lot better than we're doing right now. Um, and hence the kind of like the need and the urgency of addressing test managers, test specialists to kind of like start not thinking about solely the test, but actually thinking about the whole flow that they are participating in uh, during a software development project. Cabus Jones, which is a kind of like a metric school, uh, is has constantly been uh, kind of like monitoring uh, software measurements. This is kind of like a quite old slide, uh, even though he reproduced it in 2017. Uh, it might not kind of like fit into all the in, uh, the environments that we're working in today, especially not when we're talking about artificial intelligence or other types of project. And it doesn't fit for sure in the agile or DevOps uh, world, where we probably would see a shift of, uh, of the defect injection to, uh, to the left side because they are found earlier in the life cycle. But it gives a pretty good picture of, you know, when in the process would we see defects found and what will be the cost to repair the defect. So if we are an agile project to early testing and, and shift to the right, we probably will still find the same defects. So the defect injection will be the same as if we had waited until the system test. But what we would do would be that we would shorten the cost of, uh, to repair defect. So bear this in mind because I don't have any, you know, numbers or figures for the cost to repair defect. And uh, I'm going to talk about doing this, how you can collect your own data within your environment in order to get that right uh, for your type of organization, your type of technology, and your type of uh, process environment. Uh, again, a waterfall slide, it is not meant to be uh, kind of like the idea of everything needs to be waterfall, but in waterfall projects, 16% of the effort is uh, used on testing. So improving optimization and uh, making test, uh, test the right way and estimated the right way is a good idea. Now, I'm going to talk to you about what happens with these 16% at a later slide when I talk about how to estimate the test effort. So this is what I see today. Uh, as I talked about earlier, uh, sometimes, you know, we, we have a tendency of thinking that the closer we get to test, the more done we are. Uh, and we can see kind of like a, a kind of like a bright light of how much effort is needed in order to complete. And what I have seen and a lot of the critical projects that I have been asked to go in to do a recovery plan for, they have actually reached the test uh, period, maybe even a couple of times before they realize that something is really, really wrong in what they are doing. And that actually means that this huge amount of bubble 
of the effort and cost and we work occur during the, uh, the test period. So even though we go back and we rework and we rebuild and we redesign, um, the effort and the, uh, the estimates is actually in the testing phase. Um, so my recommendation is actually that when you, you plan a project, you should actually plan and estimate two separate streams. You should plan an estimate for the work that the developers are doing in order to deliver the product. And you should plan and estimate the work that needs to be done in order to ensure that the work that is developed by the testers is accepted all the way from integration tests, data quality, um, user acceptance tests to the production test. So you should plan an estimate and actually have two separate streams. This will make a, a lot of demands on the test managers, but I also believe that a lot of the challenge and unsuccessful project is actually due to that strong project managers they usually don't know much about testing. They never ever, you know, been a test manager. They never ever had the responsibility. They never ever tried to communicate with a user to try to grasp their perspective of using the software. They think about it as a, a technical uh, software design rather than they think about it as a user interface used by a user that might ha have absolutely no vocabulary, no terminology that is related to software development. Um, I'm gonna uh, use an example of somebody who saw the light. Uh, there's a, a Spanish company called uh, Leda MC. Uh, they have uh, specialized in, in benchmarking of software contracts. And they actually saw this uh, as a requirement and have a couple of, uh, of cases where they had been asked by their clients to go in and actually uh, take the testing as a separate stream, estimate it, price it, uh, control it, um, plan it as a separate stream along the side of the project management stream for developing the software product from a technical perspective. So one of my favorite sayings when I go into to these critical projects uh, that sometimes have, you know, been alive for, uh, for a couple of years where everybody, both developers and, and users and and uh, business owners are exhausted by the failure or the challenges that they are made, uh, meeting is that everybody gets wise to doing a software development project. And those that is actually learning the most is usually those users that when they test and see the software and see the opportunities, they sometimes see opportunities that they had no imagination to think about when the project started. That's important to remember, and that's one of the reasons why we see a lot of scope creep. We try to kind of like mitigate it by using agile techniques and uh, prototyping or system demonstration in, in scaled agile and stuff like that, but we're still not quite there. And I even seen kind of like and heard about the uh, organizations who actually think that even though they try to be agile and scaled and everything else, uh, this is one of the part that was too difficult. We need to wait until we are almost ready for production with everything before we demonstrate it. And I think that's a, that's a big mistake. When you look at the, uh, the V model, they, they have a very, very clear kind of like picture of things. So when we got the requirement specification, those are the ones that we use in the accepting uh, testing. We need to accept that the requirements are the right uh, are implemented the right way. And it doesn't matter whether it's a uh, user uh, defined requirements, you know, I want to have a screen that when I press it, it will show, or whether it is data quality requirements, uh, like we have a lot of uh, data quality requirements in healthcare, bank industry, stuff like that. 
um, when we reach the functional specification, which is how will we implement the requirements? That's when we do the system testing. That will include things like uh, maybe sometimes backend testing, uh, where we test the integration and the flow of the data between two different systems and two different infrastructures. Uh, technical specification, sorry, that's the integration testing. Uh, the program specification, that's the unit testing, and then we got the coding in the middle. Now, actually, all these in my mind flow together, and a lot of projects that I have joined, the only time that they have made things like test cases or defined how they're going to test in detail and make sure that the test data was adequate was uh, in acceptance testing. And sometimes with great difficulties, um, it can sometimes take, you know, weeks of effort to figure out exactly what they need to test, even though we got, you know, good requirement specification, because the requirement specification might have been created with the technical implementation in mind and not with the user focus. Again, Agile is solving some of these issues with user stories, but not necessarily all of them. Somehow we need to bridge the gap between the technical perspective and the user perspective. And I just let uh, Sania in and I hope that she hadn't waited too long in the waiting room, but I hadn't seen that she had she was waiting there. So I apologize for that. So what about the automated versus manual testing from an estimating perspective? It, it kind of like, again, you need to estimate in separate screens. And, and in the automated test, we might even have kind of like a, a bit of an overlap here. Uh, the automating uh, testing, we need to still do the definition and design of how we're going to test. Um, in the manual testing, the design is, of course, uh, test cases. In the automated uh, testing, it might be a design document. Um, in the automated testing, we need to build the automated test, which might take, you know, quite a long time. And in the manual test, we need to do the test executing. Um, in the automated test, we need to, of course, test uh, using the automated test that might be as fast as pressing the button. But we actually need to, before we press the button, we need to test that the automated test is working, which again includes the manual testing. The manual testing, we need the resources. We, and we need to think about when we talk about manual testing, some uh, software development project only think about the effort engaged from their perspective. But if you look at the cost of a project from the business owner perspective, the cost of the project is not only the test resources that is part of the technical development project, but it's also striking people out from the production. Um, in healthcare, asking doctors to take a day off, not doing operations or not for seeing patients because they need to test uh, the healthcare systems. And then we got, of course, the rework. And uh, for the automated test, we still have all the things that cannot be automated which then shift to the right in the manual test. And in the manual uh, testing estimate, we need to remember all the times we need to repeat the test. And um, if we have a test that is unsuccessful, even though it might be fulfilling all the requirements, uh, but you know everybody is just, you know, this is not gonna work for me. We're missing all these things which in reality is scope feed and not defects, but it's recognized during the testing effort, then we might have, you know, to do the whole cycle again and start all over. And that's another type of repeat of the test. So if some of you are, are uh, test nerdy uh, people, you would know some of these measurements. Uh, we will test, you know, we will measure test efficiency uh, we will measure test status. We will measure test resources. 
we will measure product quality. And, and that's the right thing to do. Um, now, it is unfortunately quite seldom that I actually see anybody not just measuring, but also estimating how much they are anticipating in these areas that they are estimating. And that I think is, is a missing bit in the professionalism of estimating. So I think that, uh, that we should start kind of like not only focusing on the measurement, but also focus on the forecast. Now I need to go back to my screen. Oh. So a, a way of kind of like uh, presenting the test execution status is this, um, but a way to, to have kind of like a background would be to how many percentage of the, uh, the test cases, for instance, uh, would we accept being blocked before we stop the testing and go back to the drawing board? How many of the test cases will we accept being failed? Maybe prioritize the test cases and do some of these things and then make a risk calculation of how that will impact our estimates. So again, you know, bring measurement, your measurement fault into not only being something you measure during the execution, but also something that you think about at the early stages of the project, already at the requirement definition phase. And then I think you should start using function point analysis. And I'm gonna try to explain to you why I think that function point analysis should not just be a tool and a methodology that is used for focusing on the building and the uh, development of a software project, project, but also something that should be used during the testing focus. And again, think when I'm talking now, think about testing being a separate stream, thinking about, you know, function point analysis uh, from a testing perspective. So, for those of you who doesn't know function point analysis, you don't need to worry about it. We got plenty of certified function point specialists, thanks to Brightest. And a function point specialist is an expert in bridging between user, technical, and planning needs. And I've not to date as the IFPOC president and, and volunteer in IFPOC met somebody who hasn't kind of like evolved into a planning expert, a business analyst, and a person that is quite used to communicate with the users. Um, the four areas of uh, the benefits of function point analysis that we're gonna talk about is the business process and software requirements breakdown today. And then we're gonna talk about the scope analysis and control from a user perspective. And then we're gonna talk about how the function point analysis will enable us to create a list of transactions to be tested. So that will actually be something that we can use quite early in the life cycle of a project to estimate the amount of effort required for doing testing. And finally, key performance normalization factor, because bringing in function point analysis would actually enable you to not only focus on, on the planning and the uh, monitoring and control of your testing area, but also kind of like make sure that the quality that you built the product and the quality and the amount of defects that you find is actually bringing you up to the top of successful projects. Um, and just a note here, <laughs> my perspective, and I think you just lost me for a second. Am I back, Amelia? Yes, you are. Good. So um, from my perspective, finding a defect is a success. And the more defects we find, the more successful we are. As long as we don't find more defects than we anticipated. And the reason for this is that if you know how many defects you 
will likely find, if you find less than those defects, the hypothesis is that you might end up having defects in production, and that's not a good thing. And then you might need to think about whether your testing has been thoroughly enough. So without having estimated amount of defect that is likely to find, you won't know whether you have done an excellent test. So finding defects in my book is a good thing. So function point analysis is, is a quite rigorous methodology to take the requirements or the design documents if you are at that stage or a project uh, that is almost completed. You can actually do it in, in all stages, but gather the available requirements, determine the scope and identify functional user requirement. And you do that by measuring two types of area, data functions and transactional function. I'm gonna talk a lot today about transactional function, but when you look at the data function, it will be those that you would be used in a detailed test case, or it will be those information that you will be using when you do data quality testing. So I won't talk much about that. The final result is a functional size. I'm not gonna talk much about that one either, but the functional size can be used to predict the estimates. So uh, we got tools and, and benchmark data and approaches to take the function point analysis and basically tell how much effort, what is the likely and most optimal schedule of duration to deliver a project. And you can also use the functional size to predict how many defects is likely to find. Um, and you can document and report all this information so that it's available for scope monitoring and controls. So solving some of the issues that makes us having challenge or fail projects today. Organizations like the European Union, Italian governments, the private sector like communication sectors, Mac free large uh, insurance companies, uh, large uh, communication companies, Vodafone, Orange and stuff like that are using function point analysis to both control and estimate projects and also to control and estimate the cost of delivery. Um, a lot of times we are using function point analysis in my mind without kind of like taking in all the good things that it gives you when you do it right. Um, and one of the good things that it gives you is things that you can actually use in the testing process. I'm going to talk about that now. So basically, if we try to make an analogy of, of what function point analysis is, uh, you can think about it in Lego blocks. I'm Danish, so I love Lego blocks. Even, uh, you know, we've got Lego all over the place in our house. Um, so if you think about Lego blocks, what does it take to build a Lego construction? Um, sometimes you get this special piece that is pre-built, so you don't need to put blocks together. That would be almost like a cuts package, but you still need to kind of like make sure that it's part of your design documentation, that it fits into the rest of the building blocks that you do. Um, sometimes you have a very kind of like easy uh, go project, uh, a bit like playing with Lego Duplo. It's fast, it's easy, it's comprehensive, it's obvious what you need to do. And other times you need to, uh, to build, you know, a complex Lego Technic uh, car. In the end, the uh, specification, the requirements to build a Lego construction can be broken into different pieces like bricks, plates, tiles, uh, slopes, techniques, etc. Um, so think about function point as the methodology that takes all these requirements 
and basically put the requirements into buckets of different types. One of the, uh, the ways that we do this is that we look at everything from a requirement perspective, from a user perspective. And there's a little twist to the user definition in, um, in, uh, in function point. And that is that a user can be any person or thing that communicates or interacts with the software at any time. And that's why I got the robot here instead of the human being. Because if, um, if your security system has requirements that is demanded for all your software products, then it might not be the user from you know, a perspective of a user perspective, uh, the end user, the person uh, punching the keyboard, uh, but they still have requirements uh, to the application that might end up being either non-functional requirements, and that means we won't size it using function points, but we will identify it, but we can't size it, or functional requirement, uh, a bit like a user story. When the user logs on, we always need to vet in the security database that this user is allowed to see these patient information as an example. So there is a complex logic behind it. It ends up being an integration. It ends up being a user requirement. Uh, we also have other kind of like perspective of the user view requirements uh, needs to be agreed upon and understood by both the user and software developers. And uh, it needs to be user recognizable and satisfy functional requirements. Now, if I think test cases, then I think that a test case should always be created in a way where it's understood by both the user and the software developers. Because otherwise, the test case <clears throat> will only be executed by the end users. And understanding the test case for a software developer, in my mind, is critical in order to get the technical stream to actually build the right type of functionality as the end user is expecting. And now I think you lost me again. So user yeah, recognizable, understood by both the user and software developers, and it needs to satisfy a functional requirement is some of the things that I think a lot of the test cases is deemed to fulfill. So one of the things that I always as a function point analyst do, and I also do it even though I, I don't actually uh, use function points, uh, but I need to understand something is that we create these boundaries from a business perspective. And a drawing around boundaries, if a function point analyst does that, is actually a really, really good way of depicting the things that you need to test so that everybody can speak to each other, even though they might be you know, stakeholders from different areas of the business, or there are different types of software developers with different levels of, the, of understanding of the user perspective. I call these uh, boundaries a thousand feet, and I'm going to show you how it can be done. Uh, a boundary drawing for a thousand feet can be, you know, uh, depicting just a high level business area. It can depict the most important inputs, integrations, reports, uh, but not all of them. So it, it kind of like it's a high level. It just kind of like states what needs to be done. It might depict a bit of, uh, if sometimes we, we talk about these databases or uh, data storage uh, areas as if it was you know, common to, to the end, end user. But uh, it might be a good thing to have that included. And um, every time you have a boundary, 
you, you actually have some type of integration. It might be one big system. I don't know how you, from a technical perspective, is coding things, but it might be one big system. But you might need one type of users to test application A and another type of users to test application C. And that means that when you want to test the integration between application A and C, you actually need the user from both boundary A and boundary C. So it's kind of like, um, it's not always a technical boundary. Sometimes it's a logical boundary. Um, but the function point analyst will help you kind of like create this overview. Since the function point analyst would usually go in early in the life cycle of a project already in requirement gathering or requirement definition phase, you can get this uh, thousand feet boundary uh, diagram very, very early in the life cycle and thereby not only use the function point for estimating the technical part, but also use the function point analysis and the output from the function point analysis to help you estimate the, uh, the work and communicate on the work you need to do and the stakeholders you need to engage uh, early in the life cycle that requirement phase. Then, uh, as I said to you, uh, one of the areas that we size is transactional functions. And when we look at transactional functions, we're looking at, you know, functionality that are either also the behavior of the application, uh, maintain data or present information to the user. And there are three types of uh, transactional functions that we look at. And the way that we identify them, which I'm gonna talk to you guys about in a minute, is actually in my mind, a one-to-one -one link to a test case with steps, but a one-to-one -one link to test cases with steps. So I would say that if you had a function point analysis completed, I would ask the function point specialist, how many transactions did you find? And if they say I found 500 transactions, then I would make the immediate assumption that means that I need to create at least 500 test cases. The reason why this is that, is that when we find transaction, we use a definition called elementary process, which is composing or decomposing into the smallest unit of activity, we satisfy the following, that it's meaningful to the user, that it constitutes a complete transaction. And that means that if I can pause or stop, then it might be you know, two transactions instead of just one. But if I need to go all the way before my transaction is completed, then you, from a test perspective, have the entire flow in one elementary process. Then it's self-contained. I can do this without thinking about anything else. When I log on, I can log on, I can leave my desk, and then I'm locked out at some point. But that's another transaction that recognizes that I'm not doing anything. Those will be two transactions and then leaves the business of the application in a consistent state. So it's not popping up with messages asking me to still, you know, are you sure or do you wanna continue? Um, because that will be step number seven and step number eight in the test case. You know, when a button is, is popping up, you need to make a decision in order uh, to complete the transaction. So, Another thing that is regarding the elementary process is that it needs to have the same uh, type of data. So I've put in, we call it debts in reality, it's attributes or fields, um, and we call it FTRs, and in reality, it's, it's kind of like data that you maintain. And then it needs to require the same set of processing logic. So if you have a complex kind of like process in your, in your software that will kind of like do all these jumps and mathematical calculation and stuff like that, then it might be that it's different processing logic. And that means that you need different test cases. And in function point analysis, it will be sized as different transactions. 
in the end, that means that if we, for instance, take uh, an example of an elevator with a little bit of artificial intelligence in it, then we would have, uh, as an example, a boundary, which is the elevator's interface. That's what I see when I go into the elevator and I press some buttons. Um, we would have uh, a boundary which is related to uh, all the techniques, engineering techniques behind it that controls that when I press a button, then the elevator actually goes up to the fifth floor. And there might be the algorithm uh, of the AI, which calculate, for instance, in high towers that, you know, at, at four o'clock, there's a lot of rush going on at level four. So make sure that we've got a lot of elevators close to a level four or waiting at level four for somebody to show up. And in the end, the result will look like this. Uh, a transaction, for instance, that states turn on the red light and the cab arrives and then turn off the right light and save the information that somebody has, you know, ask for the elevator to uh, uh, to go to level four. Um, and that information is saved in, in a data file, which is the floor information. Um, we might have some historical information uh, that is maintained uh, in order to use it for artificial intelligence. And that means that we also got a logical file with, uh, uh, with data storage of the historical information. So this is just a very, very high level. Uh, if you think this is interesting, highly recommend. Uh, get hold of your closest uh, CFPS and, and start talking to them about it. If we uh, look at, the, uh, at an example of how the boundary diagram could be created as 100 feet and actually be input to you know, a test case, uh, you can uh, have a use case, for instance, and have a, a lower level of the boundary, which has all the inputs and outputs and all the data that we are engaged with so that we make sure that we all the way from the functional testing to the integration testing to the user acceptance test is covering all the types of testing that we need to do. And we also got on the boundary diagram which are our main actor, which is our main resource that we need to use when, uh, when doing the user acceptance test. Now, some of the, the reasons why I wanted to dig into this is, of course, you know, that if we start kind of like communicating about what test cases do we need to create already at the definition phase, at the requirement gathering phase, then that also means that we start actually uh, doing review and uh, peer review and testing of the documentation. We do uh, shared communication on the understanding of the documentation because the output of a function point analysis is actually quite easy to understand for both the user and the, uh, and the uh, solution designer and the uh, software developers. And that means that the cost of, of defect found, we will be able to shift that so that we have as little $5,000 defect as possible, and we have as many $250 uh, defect as we need in order to have a successful project. Um, we also got data uh, about the uh, defects per function points um, and the different phases. Now, Every time we look at benchmark data from the industry, I highly recommend that you start locking yourself. Uh, you don't need to lock many defects uh, before you get a trend setting in your organization, and especially not if you've got complex projects. So if we look at it from the acceptance criteria, the, the 1,000 feet is almost like an epic. You know, we, we need to develop this uh, business uh, process or we need to re-engineer it or we need to enhance it. 
we create user stories or use cases uh, or whatever you use for documenting uh, the requirements. We create acceptance criteria that is both non-functional and functional. And based on this, we create test cases. And Function Pine can actually kind of like support this process and also monitor that when we looked at the product backlog, our first early estimates was that we thought that it will be, you know, 20 transactions, the size of 1,000 function points. And when we reach the user stories and we're done with 50% of them, we suddenly have, you know, double the transaction and we have, you know, maybe uh, changed the, uh, the function point uh, analysis uh, with as much as a factor two. Double. Um, so you can use kind of like the, the, the deeper you get, you can use the function point analysis to predict. So I usually call it the solving the tree fall knot because doing software development projects and testing software development um, products is, uh, is not an easy task uh, from a function point perspective and from a test perspective, my recommendation is therefore to use the 1000 feet diagram to get an overview and, and create ballpark estimates on how large and how many transaction and thereby how many test cases you need to use to create. Uh, link the function point analysis to tests, trace the scope using function point analysis, Use the 100 feet diagram to verify successful uh, testing. Take off in the diagram that you have done everything when you are testing and creating the test cases. Um, use proper resources for estimating and scope control. Um, you can be a really, really good project manager and a really good test manager, very, very good test executor but not necessarily an expert in estimating. Those are, in my mind, uh, two different things. And uh, you need to have this kind of like specialized, you might become an expert, but you might need uh, in the beginning a, a little bit of uh, support to do this. My final statement, um, as I already said, focus on testing as a project or path by itself. Um, I recommend that you use function points to estimate the size and number of test cases early. Use historical data, preferred your own, to, uh, to estimate the expected amount of defect. Uh, but also use, you know, both have your own benchmark and it got the industry benchmark. Then you've got two guidelines to, to follow. Uh, use measurements to, to track and monitor. And again, the measurement uh, that the things that you're going to measure should also be the things that you're going to focus on estimating. Use what you learn to be better at what you do. And that concludes my presentation. All right. Thank you very much, Christine, for this presentation. Um, wonderful. Um, clear everything. <laughs> I have um, some questions here in the chat. Um, for now, there's one from Bogdan, who asks, which is uh, the best recommended learning material to start learning function point analysis? Yeah, what I recommend is that you start by finding somebody close to, to your uh, side, especially due to language barriers. Sometimes it's, uh, it's easier to get trained by somebody who speaks your own language. Um, so, but we got different companies on the website who has certified function point analysis training material, and uh, those are kind of like around the globe. So find one of those and contact them and ask them when they're going to have their next training class. All right. I hope Bogdan, this answered your, your question. We have some others, not yet in the chat, but I have some here. Um, is if POC function point a consistent size measure? Yes, it is. Now, 
like anything else, um, the analogy that I usually do when I do the function point analysis training is that when, when you get, you know, if you want to get trained to be a carpenter, you might kind of like not measure correctly all the time. So you need to get the training, you need to understand the process. And I also recommend that you get mentoring. But when you get mentoring and when you have training and you classify, for instance, as a certified function point specialist, the, the results that we have is that people are able to be plus and minus 5% within each other without communicating with each other. Now, bear in mind that the way that they size function point in those cases would be interpreting the requirements. And you all know when you look at requirements, sometimes you have statements where you need to make an assumption. And if you clear out the assumption, so if you have kind of like the discussion between the two parties that are doing the function point analysis, then you will be consistent. But there is a, the methodology is not automated because the only way you could automate function points would be to, to size the code that has already been developed. And what we wanna do is size the amount of time or the things we need to do in order to develop the, the code and test the code and bring the code into production. So in that sense, it's written material. Um, and when you got a human factor, it's like a software developer is also human even though they are automating business processes, they're human, they make mistakes. Sometimes a uh, function point analyst makes mistakes as well. But when you review it, when you verify it, you can get it quite accurate and quite consistent. It is more consistent than counting lines of code because software developers also got different techniques uh, when coding. Um, so in that sense, it's a better size mission than lines of code. Um, when you compare it to things like story points, uh, story points is based on the team's productivity. So, and the team's knowledge where function point is independent of the team. So you can kind of like take a function point count from one project and replicate it on another project and you can compare the size on the two. And if you do, for instance, projects where you uh, repeat yourself. So if you have a product, for instance, that you hand out with, with customization to different users, then you just need to do the function point analysis once. And then you need to enhance it with those items that you either, or those functionalities that you either remove or add or change. And that also means that you will be able to use function point analysis even when you kind of like produce products and hand it out to different uh, clients or different user groups. I hope that that answered your question. <laughs> I think so. And I see there is another question that just popped up in the chat. I don't know if you can see, Christine, um, the next question. We have a few minutes left, so maybe you would like to, to answer it. Um, as per today's discussion, test cases, uh, function points should be as per transaction function point. So while calculation uh, calculating total effort, i.e. development and testing, how we should proceed. Um, this is, I don't know, I'm not sure the question was complete, but. I'm not sure, man, Juice, I understand your question there. Um, so test case function point should be as per transaction. No, actually not. Uh, first of all, that, that's actually wrong, but the transaction would usually, with a few exceptions, of course, there's always exceptions to the rules, but 
usually one transaction that is identified during a function point analysis would equal that you need to create a test case. But the data function, which is the depiction of the logical data group that you will maintain, would usually be used in test cases where you test data quality. And they would usually also be part of things like what test data you need to create. It will be part of things like what type of, um, of attribute do you need to uh, val validate when you look at the uh, at test cases, um, so there is there is uh, information that is of value in the data functions as well. Um, now, from a development perspective, the total effort. Yeah, that I might need to say something about that because if, when you as I said, if you look at the uh, the cone of uncertainty that I shared with you guys with this bubble of testing, because a lot of times when I'm looking at failed projects or challenge project in the past, one of the things that I could see was that they had vastly underestimated the testing effort. Um, and you also need to bear in mind that if you're using uh, testing tools, which is based on, uh, or estimating tools, sorry, that is based on benchmark data, those projects that they have in their database is usually the successful project and not the failed project and not the challenged project. Um, so, so that's why I, the 16% that was from iSpec, I have seen that tripled. I've uh, seen them uh, kind of like a lot higher, especially when data quality and user friendliness is high, you know, value objectives for the product, then, uh, then the 16% might not be an accurate estimate. Manjus, uh, did that answer your question? Perfect, yes. thank you. <laughs> we keep having questions coming in. We're coming um, to the full hour. Um, we can continue if you'd like to respond one more question, Christine, or maybe um, we should call it an end. Yeah, I, I can uh, answer Bogdan's question and then uh, we can say that, uh, that that's the last question for today. Perfect. The others can be sent to us, of course. <laughs> yeah. So what are the main difference between estimating in function point a whole software project with the value of one function point, including the testing or to estimate separately in function point, the testing part? So. This is again, you know, as I stated just before, uh, the, the issue with the testing and estimating the whole project is that usually you don't take into consideration some of the difficulties with testing. So, and that's why I say to you guys that my recommendation is actually to have it as two streams. So you do a function point analysis once. You do that based on the requirements. And what you do with the function point analysis is that you use the transactions to estimate the amount of test cases. Now, as I also said in, in the beginning, remember the amount of iterations you need to do. So if you and your function point analysis, it's kind of like quite a lot of boundaries, even though it's, it's one project, um, then you might, need to think about that you need to run it several times. You need to have, you know, the testers represented from both boundaries. You need to kind of like have software developers that understand both boundaries during the testing. 
and they need to maybe have a integration test where they basically, you know, send data, receive data, send data, and verify the data quality. So you can use the, you know, function point analysis to estimate the entire project, but I would still pick out the testing effort and have a critical look at the testing effort before I decide that this is my final estimate for the project. Um, so estimating techniques using function point doing parametric estimate doesn't always include everything. You still need to be critical of the results, but bringing together multiple types of estimating techniques, parametrics, what did we do last time, the analog, the expert, what do you think that it's gonna take for you to do this project? And now what I introduced to you today include, you know, metrics and measurements and, you know, units of size by the number of transactions, their complexity, stuff like that. The number of iterations you need to run the test, bring that one in to verify your estimates. That's always a good idea. And you cannot get, you know, the return of investment of multiple estimating techniques is, is just right there. Thank you, Bob Fern. Thank you. And I've just added in the chat for everyone who would like um, to ask more questions. I've added our contact um, email, info at brightest.org. Please feel free to send your questions and we, of course, will pass them to Christine if um, you have any more uh, information you'd like. If you'd like to receive more information about the certification itself and the exam, you're welcome also to um, to contact us. Christine, somehow we've lost you on the video, but uh, I will. <laughs> um, I would like to thank you very much for accepting our invitation today. Excuse I'm me. Still here. I'm still here. <laughs> but I can see, yes, you lost me on the video. Yes, unfortunately, but we have your photo there, so all good. Um, but thank you again um, for accepting our invitation. It was lovely to to get to know more. Hey, there you are um, about function points analysis tonight. And uh, I would like to thank everyone for for joining us. It was um, lovely to be able to host this event and we will be looking forward to seeing you the next time in the next occasion. So Thank you for having me, Brightest. It was a pleasure. My pleasure. <laughs> um, wishing you all a lovely evening and see you very soon. Bye-bye. <laughs>